We're going to uh, talk about the evolution of platforms and mm -hmm. delivering video and how revolutionary everything is, is and sort of what you've been working through all these years and we met some years ago in Palo Alto at the Always On conference and you had this crazy mm -hmm. idea of an open source video player based on Linux and everyone thought it was meh, that's like, and now it's, 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 the adoption has been really big and tell us a little bit about the scope of the business now and uh, particularly in the enterprise and for media companies and give us a little update. Sure, yeah, we met at the Always On. Tony Perkins is a good friend and supporter of the company and it's been phenomenal since. We're in about 250,000 sites. Uh, to give you a feel for the type of stuff that's being used in Kultura and the media world with customers like ABC and Disney and HBO and many others, direct and indirect, there are companies in this room that are using Kultura. We're in countless TV stations and otherwise. We do more than a billion streams a month just in the media sector. If you look at the enterprise sector, we're in companies like SAP and AT&T and Bank of America and Accenture and many others. Uh, empowering millions of employees and their use of videos every month. And in the education sector, we're in about 500 schools in the U.S. alone, campuses out of the 5,000, so there's still ways to go. Uh, but these include all the Ivy League schools, actually, except Brown, so we're still trying to catch Brown. But we're in Harvard, Yale, MIT, Stanford, Princeton, and, and counting. And we're touching millions of students every month. So when you look at the footprint of the company today, it's really, really outstanding. So, uh, which is a, a, a big, in terms of the conversation the last couple of days, you guys are, are, are having a business as, as an enterprise, it's not based on advertising or media or revenue share, and, and how, is that fair to so, say? So, what is it that we do? We're a video management platform, in some cases we're kind of the Cisco of this conversation, we're, we're the pipes, we're under in many of the conversations that are happening here. We help uh, deliver the video experience. Well, starting from uploading the content, managing the content, distributing it into a lot of different websites, physically publishing it so that it could run on any device in any environment, creating the engaging environment that would create um, uploading by other users, et cetera, but are kind of the glue that would enable other vendors, including some of the folks that are in this room that are working with us to be able to deliver their product. So just to give a few more examples on that and, and back to your question about the business model. Um, when we work in the media world, Publishers, whether they be the large broadcasters or blogs or whatever, they use us either as SaaS on our data centers and or on-premise behind their firewall. And they pay us recurring monthly fees or yearly basis. And it's not based on CPM and it's not uh, this. It's based on the amount of video used broadly for, for video, for, for the media vertical. In the case of enterprises that I've named a bunch, they have both external use cases, which would mean they use us for sales and marketing, uh, we are in major outlets, et cetera, where they reach a lot of customers. And usually that's paid based on how many views of the videos, but also a lot of internal stuff. That's part of the very exciting stuff we've seen over the past uh, 12, 18 months is collaboration in the enterprise and training and learning in the enterprise. Just like we have companies like Yammer or Jive that brought Facebook to the enterprise, Twitter to the enterprise, we're bringing YouTube into the enterprise. We have the corporate YouTube-like environment. And there they pay based on the number of employees. And lastly, when you look at students, when they consume video in the campuses or outside the campuses, it's based on the number of students that are in the institution. But in all these different cases, it's a combination of the consumption of video and the people who are consuming the video. We're not necessarily making money out of the advertising. That we're leaving for the ad networks and the ad servers that we're working with. And also any other um, aggregators of content, we're enabling them to come in. Our philosophy in general is to be very inclusive. We'll talk a little bit about the open source angle and to enable all the other ecosystem players to come in and make money and not just us. Great. We caught up with your staff in Berlin a few weeks ago at the big education summit. Yeah. And uh, education and video is a huge, huge thing. Yeah. And um, it's really unfolding and there's a lot of big experiments. Tell us a little bit about at least on the higher education side, what you're doing with some of the IVs and the other institutions, some cool stuff they're, they're doing in terms of lectures or interactive sure. learning, or give us kind of an update on video and higher ed. So it is huge, it's, it's, it's growing, and clearly the, the ages of the guys that are coming now to college, they're, they're 18, 20, they're already well entrenched and they use YouTube all in and all out, and they wanna use that as part of their learning experience, outside of the classroom and inside of the classroom. There's a big trend now, apropos the outside and the inside, 
of what's called the flipped classroom that would enable people to actually learn the material outside of the classroom and when they get into the classroom to be able to uh, drill it or to, to just work with the, with the professors instead of just learning the material to actually do actual drills about it. And there's what's called MOOCs, uh, which are uh, solutions like Coursera and otherwise that are massive open courses and there are free courses out there by way of video. And with all these different trends, video plays a very, very integral role. There's four different use cases or so when we look at the higher ed for Kultura. The first is integration into the learning platforms. Uh, for those who know that world, uh, companies like Blackboard and Moodle or solutions like Moodle or Sakai or Instructor or Desire to Learn, these are content management systems that are connecting between staff, professors, and students. So when the student comes in and wants to put his assignment in place or the professor wants to go to the class, they don't do that anymore just in the class, they do that using the web environment. What we've done is we videoified these systems because these systems by and large were kind of Gen 1, and they were mainly regular text, but they were missing the opportunity for professors to put reg relevant videos in it or for students to upload videos or to have any type of rich media discourse. And the places they did have that didn't include back into, if we talk about search down to the metadata or, or the spoken word, didn't include the opportunity to find that word or jump into the part of the lecture that's relevant didn't enable students to actually put up a video or for it to be viewed in a high quality in a mobile device. So what we've done is we've created plug-in into these environments and now any one of the students that's using the regular environment for learning now has a vast array of capabilities around video within these environments and within these systems. That's number one. The other environment, so I said there's several use cases, is kind of having the, uh, the university YouTube-like environment. So just for social interaction, you wanna have a local place where you can look, uh, watch all the videos that are relating to sports or to social interaction or in general courses. We provide that corporate or in this case university YouTube black environment that's closed with permissions, you know which student goes to which course and what they should see and what they shouldn't see with the right recommendation, the right environment. So all that out of the box experience within uh, the university. The third use case is digitizing stuff at the libraries. You'd be amazed how much amazing stuff is out there. A lot of it isn't digitized and once it is, doesn't reach the right people. They don't know where to find it, how to search for it, how to get that um, and use that within the classwork. So these are kind of the three top use cases. The fourth one is more for the university and that's for um, um, bringing students in, just marketing the university. And we have a cross university wide solution that basically with one infrastructure, you could deploy three or four or five different apps that would enable you everything from admissions and marketing and local sports teams all the way to digitizing and archiving and enabling the students. And that's a huge amount. The last thing you asked about lectures and how that happens. Um, today, uh, there are lecture capture systems that are very expensive. You need to install them in the class. You can't move them around. One of the things we're introducing later in this year is stuff that's much more affordable and that's based on just cell phones and mobile devices that could capture the classroom experience and put it onto the system. And that with a combination of searching down to the spoken word is really, really key because it's just saying that the only thing that's more boring than being in class and listening to a boring professor is watching a video of a boring professor. Right, so you want to enable it such that people, when they're at home, they can find exactly what they want and how they want, and that's not enabled today. So a combination of software solutions and also deployment with new devices in a new way would enable it to become more affordable mm -hmm. and much more usable than it is today. So Ron, just finally, what are the implications of this with education? I mean, for education itself and perhaps for culture or business. I mean, this work you're doing in the in, in this is you know kind of on the bleeding edge of emerging media and. What are the implications for higher ed or for the rest of the media world? I think the first thing to understand is that every company is a media company. I think historically when we look at um, this whole world of online video, we try to mimic the television and say this is broadcast, so this is gonna be the same thing when you look at the internet. But the internet offers two-way uh, engagement, it offers a conversation with other people, offers personalization and so many different things that are key not just for how we entertain each other, but how we train, educate, and collaborate one with the other. Uh, and when you look at content on television as it is, a lot of the content there is not for pure entertainment. A lot of it is to learn, a lot of it is to get educated. So I think that by first of all breaking that concept of media equals advertising, media equals making money out of watching it, but media equals conveying a message. By the way, you can make a lot of money as a brand just by introducing your message as a brand. And that's why we work with so many corporations out there without necessarily putting in advertising. So I think 
What education could bring to the world is the ROI of the content itself. A lot of people spoke about here about the, the viewers and to some extent is a content premium or not, but does it convey what you want it for it to convey? And it's, sometimes it's not as simplistic as just watching and saying, okay, I want to buy something from GM. It's understanding what it has to offer you and what it has to give you. And I think that going through a classroom experience and we spoke earlier and Adam mentioned Matrix and, and KPIs, what is it that you need to take out of the video? And did you actually get it out of the video? Are you educated better because of it? You could put polls inside it and questions inside it and issues. There's different ways to check the engagement and level. This is what we're trying to bring into it, back into um, individualized uh, value using video and in the context of learning and later also in the context of, uh, I will say one last thing if I may about open source. I think the vision and the culture and the mission that we've had when we started off was bringing out an environment that is open, flexible, and collaborative. And I think one of the beautiful things that we look at in C and Kultura is that there's huge value in that. You know, the fact that it's open enables people to have the freedom of treating it like their own. And we often interact with companies that are saying, we'd like to control it. And we're like, please go ahead. The code is yours. You could install it locally. The issue of integration is really key because a lot of people want to make it their own, not just by owning it, but by customizing it and changing it. And there's so many different workflows and nuances, and we're not all the same. Not all companies are the same. That enables them to do it differently. And lastly, the collaboration element. I spoke about that earlier. We have an application exchange with 100 and more companies that have created plugins into Kultura. We're not the smartest people in the room. There's so much innovation happening around video. I think what's important is to enable, to be a glue that would enable to accept that. And if we're looking at what we're most proud of is not just by way of the customers that are using us, but how the ecosystem is forming around us and with us. That's really good.